for me. 
welcome to our uh, church uh, online podcast today, our video podcast. And so I'm glad that you've come to uh, join us and do church online. And uh, even though we're not able to be together physically in the same place, uh, we're together in spirit. It says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is, there is liberty and, and uh, God dwells where two or three are gathered together in his name. And so as we gather, even if it's at individual households right now, we are still together in the presence of God. And so I want you to, as we dig into the truth of God's word uh, today, as we pray together, I want this to be like a conversation. I just, as much as possible, I'd love to be sitting in your living room with you guys. I miss you guys. Uh, and I just, you know, I just, that's what my prayer is. That this would be more like a conversation that you would, um, you would uh, take some notes on this. You would read the scripture as we read, that you would ask the questions and to discuss it amongst yourself. So this would be like a, a coffee table discussion. And so uh, as we talk today, we're going to be spending a few weeks uh, in a um, particular story in the Bible. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about something that I think is important. And, and uh, really the series is going to be called When Your Life Turns Upside Down. Uh, and really that's dealing with disappointment, dealing with uh, situations um, that happened to you that, that, that turns your life that you didn't see coming. A uh, great uh, example of that is, is um, we have lots of different um, stories, but one of them that I'd like to share with you today is, is uh, both my, my friend Danny and I, he's now my brother-in-law, uh, we were uh, living in Croatia as missionaries, and one of, the, uh, one of our, we were planting a, a new church, and we wanted to travel with our church there, and so we purchased a van, a uh, Volkswagen van, yep, a Volkswagen van, if you can believe it, with the engine in the back, uh, in uh, Austria. And so we um, had to travel by bus up there. And so we traveled uh, all day and were awake through the night. Uh, and then to, to meet up with the person in Austria to pick up this, uh, this Volkswagen bus van. And when we picked it up and started driving home with it, we had to drive, you know, two countries over, you know, to get back to Croatia. And uh, so when we were traveling, as we drove through and we were uh, very tired and when we drove through the night, the, the, the van kept overheating. And so every, you know, uh, you know, every 15, 20 minutes, we'd have to pull over to the side, you know, let it cool a little bit and try to take that radiator cap off the back. And we'd be ah, ah, getting burned and we'd get water. And then soon we ran out of water. So we're trying to get water out of the ditch and pour it into the vehicle. And we drove through the whole night, stopping again and again through the mountains, trying to limp this van back to Croatia, back to uh, the, split, the city of Split was where we lived. And so uh, it was about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. The sun was shining. We'd been up for like two days and uh, we're driving along and finally the van just seemed to be like not overheating for a while. And uh, I look over at my friend Danny and he's just, you know, this big creation guy, he's just, he's asleep, you know, his head down there and he's just sawing logs beside me and the sun's coming in. I'm looking at the beautiful Mediterranean, you know, mountainside, you know, and thinking what a beautiful day this is. And the next moment, you know, uh, I woke up with him screaming, you know, and I was the one driving, by the way, if you missed that, uh, is we we're launching through the air, you know, and here is Danny, you know, grabbing hold of the dash and he's, oh, and we're launching through the air off the road. I'd fallen asleep and gone right off into the rocks and, and, and we in the van hit the rocks and almost turned over. It tore the tires and shredded the rims, you know, and I thought it was going to roll over. It almost rolled and it came to a stop in front of all this, you know, the, the dust settled and, the, and we both looked at each other like we're both still alive and we climb out, you know, and, and you know, and, and Danny walks to the road to see if he can flag somebody down and I walk into the bush to, to have a moment of peace, you know, because I just, my life flashed before me, let me tell you. And when I was there, Danny started yelling excitedly. And when he got excited, he forgot to speak English. And so he's yelling in Croatian. And I'm looking at him from the road and he's yelling away. You know, and I'm like, what, what are you saying? It sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I mean, this is what he's yelling. And I hear Mina, Mina. And then he's like, you're in a minefield. And I thought, this day didn't really start off this way. You know, this isn't really what I anticipated when we started off on our beautiful Mediterranean trip up to Austria to buy a van for the church is that we would crash land and walk into a minefield. But it happened nevertheless. And you know what the, the, the fact is, is that happens in your life and mine is that we get sidelined by things that we didn't see coming, the unanticipated 
um, things happen to us and turn our lives upside down. And, and uh, I want to study a particular story of, of, of King David in the Bible that he deals with a lifetime turning upside down kind of incident, you know, and, and how the, what principles we can learn on how we react to it. And just to finish the story so I don't leave, you know, leave you hanging there that I get your phone calls and emails on that is that obviously I walked out very carefully trying to retrace my steps. It didn't get blown up in the minefield and we ended up getting the, the vehicle towed back home. But uh, uh, that always stayed, uh, stayed in my mind, you know, is how quickly, you know, things can just in a moment be changed. You know, the moment you're traveling along and the beautiful sun and you're, you know, and it's shining in and the next minute you're upside down in a minefield. And so I want to uh, read a story from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. So if you can uh, turn in your Bible there, I hope you have your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, uh, put pause and run and get your Bible, you know, and come back because I want you to read this for yourself. I want, the, I want you to discover this between you and God that he would impress these things on you because that's what sticks. You know, what I tell you uh, is only going to last for a moment. You know, before the day is even out, you may forget 90% of what I've said, but if God impresses it on you and starts to stir something in and, and, and starts to make something come alive to you, going, to, yeah, this is what I need to live out, or this is some things I need to, to deal with in my life, then that's life-changing. And so uh, let's uh, dig into the truth of, of God's Word. First Samuel chapter 30, uh, let's pray to just ask God, make his word come alive to us today. Father, I thank you. Your word is living and active and alive inside of us. It's more than just history, an old dusty history book. It's more than just the words on a page, but it is alive and living inside of it. Your truth, your life comes uh, alive in your word. And so, Father, thank you. Just bring your word alive to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Samuel chapter 30. Let's read the first eight uh, verses here said that David and his men reached Ziglag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided Negev and Ziglag, and they had attacked Ziglag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. And they killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. Then David and his men came to Ziglag, and they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and their sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinon of Jezreel and Abigail, the, Woody of Nab the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was deeply distressed because the men were talking of stoning him, and each was bitter in spirit because of their sons and their daughters. But it says this, But David found strength in the Lord his God. Now, as we see in the story for, for a moment here, is that uh, David was having a bad day. I think we can paraphrase this story by saying David was having a bad day. I mean, they had been away uh, uh, at a battle. They had returned home. This was their hometown. This was their home turf. This was their city. They owned, lived in it. Uh, and they returned home. It's just like you're returning home to Hagersville or Jarvis or Nanticoke, and you return to your home, and everything has been destroyed. And not only was it burned, but they tore the, they, 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 they pulled the buildings apart, like they literally razed the city to the ground. So their hometown was, was raided and burned. Their wives and children were abducted. Think of what that would be like, is your family's all gone. Your house is gone. Your wife and your children are gone. You don't know whether they're alive or dead. You know, they've been abducted. And the men, his own men were so distressed, they'd even talked of stoning him. So even your closest friends were so upset, were, were so traumatized by this, they'd even talked of stoning David. I, I'm telling you, David was having a bad day, wasn't he? It doesn't get any worse than that. But the story doesn't end there. And that's why it's important to read these stories from the, from, from, uh, the Old Testament even, because they speak principles of who God is, principles of truth that we can apply to our life even today. So let's read what David did, because you know what? This can, we can apply to our life when we have days like this, when our zigzag burns, when our, when our life turns upside down. So uh, verse 7, it says, But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then he said to Abathar the priest, bring me the ephod. And so Abathar brought it and David asked the Lord, he said, should I chase after this band of raiders and will I catch them? 
And the Lord told them, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. So three things happened here that was really important. Number one is that David found strength and trust, remembering God's promises. So the first thing that David did, the very first action, you know, in the midst of his reaction to the trauma, to the destruction and loss of his family was that he found strength in trust. And to put it in context, I want you to understand if you read back or in the story or read earlier on to see where they're coming from. Previously, David had come from uh, a land and been living with his enemies. He really came out of a dark time. It's an odd era of David's life where he had his band of faithful followers, but the, the, the present king of Israel was trying to run him out, you know, and try to search him down and kill him. And so he was hiding among his enemies, you know, and, and it was a dark time. I don't think that this would be a time when David's life is saying, you know what, that was a high, it was a mountaintop, mountaintop point of my life. He was living with the Philistines, living with the enemy. And yet came back to the situation and he remembered, the, some translations say that he remembered the Lord is God. And you know what? And I think it was a, a coming back to God moment. I think that there was a, a realization of God's promises and who he was and to put his trust in him. Then it says the second thing that he did. So first he, he found strength in God. So there was a strengthening that, the, a strengthening that came in by remembering the promises of God. Second of all, that he stopped and prayed. How many times do we just want to, you know, like we want to do different things, but like his next action was, he said, bring the ephod. We, we need to pray. We need to seek God about this. This situation is too big for us. This situation is way too big. I, I don't know what to do. You know, what is our reaction? Like it's overwhelming. David prayed and asked God what he should do. And the third thing is that just as important as the other two is that he took action. He took action on, on, on what God said to do. And so, you know, he didn't get into a blame situation or angry or cry or sulk or self-pity, climb back into bed, you know, like he took action. He took action on, uh, on, on what God told him, said, go after this, so for your first, you'll surely recover you know, your families again. And so he took action on what God said when he was in prayer. So I want to introduce this a little bit because I, I, I want to take actually a few weeks and really unpackage this together. I want us to look at this to say, to uh, look even beyond David's life and to say there's some important promises on how we react to challenging things. Because, you know, some have said, you know, and I'm drinking my tea today. We've had coffee in the past, but I'm drinking tea. So I've got spiced chai tea today and some have said is you don't know is, is your life is like a tea bag you don't know what's really inside of you until you're put into hot water and I know that's a little cliche but you know what there is some truth to that is that really you don't know who you are as a man or as a woman uh, as a young person as a boy or a girl you don't know what you've really got inside until you're put to the test till the pressure is on and so I want to look at this situation that happened in David's life and take a few weeks and unpackage it together. But let me first just take a, a bit of time this week, actually, to just introduce it. So let's, let's unpack, let's pull it apart, and then we're going to dissect it a little bit in the coming weeks. So first of all, what's the first fact out of this situation that's something we can apply to our life? Is the first thing I want to point out, my, 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 uh, my point today is that stuff happens. I'd like to say it a little more, you know, strongly, but then we'd have to put probably a PG rating on it, you know, but crap happens. Stuff, difficult thing happens in each and every one of our lives. No one is exempt from that. Sometimes we look at other people and we think that, wow, they're born with a silver spoon in their mouth or their life is just like a bed of roses. They've got it so good and I've got it so hard. But, you know, to be honest, when you talk to almost every person, 100% of the people on the planet, everyone has a story. Everyone has things that they've gone through that were difficult to them. And so I want to encourage you today is that, you know what, to, to realize is that, you know what, stuff happens. So how do we react? So the question is, is not that why did this happen to me? You know, they go, oh, something bad happened to me. But it's looking at how do we react when these things happen? When we get laid off at work, when we get uh, a, a medical report that we're not looking for that isn't favorable, when we get a bad report on a report card or, or a job review that isn't, you know, favorable. When stuff happens, how do we react to it? 
Because then, to be honest, then you really know what you've got. You know, when you get cut from the team, when, you know, when there's, you know, when there's challenges in your relationship, whether marriage or your family or kids, and, and people aren't talking, and, and you have to resolve your way through that, then you really, you really dig deep onto who you are and what you've got. You know, then you see what you've got in a, in a friendship. So, you know, how do we, so my question today is this, how do we, how do we react when bad stuff happens to you? You know, do you look at it and be like, well, you know, as I see some conspiracy in this, you know, like a, this wasn't mine. This was, you know, the, this was this person that, you know, do we see conspiracy in everything? Do we get mad at God? Do we blame our mother-in-law? How do you react when bad stuff happens to you? Because we all have reaction modes. We, everyone has, according to their, their past experience, their family of origin, their personality types, we have reaction modes to when bad stuff happens to us. And so how do you react? Some go silent, some go angry, and they explode like a volcano. But almost every one of us humans asks why. Why is this going on? So my question to you today is, what if you never get to know the why of how that something happened? Because, you know, when, when talking with people, and I love working with people and hearing their stories, but one key theme that I would hear again and again in people's lives is they just want to know why something happened. Why my mother-in-law was, you know, uh, did this, or why did, why, 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 did, why did I lose this family member? Why did this, you know, situation happen? Why did I lose my business, you know, and our finances get, you know, and, and they want to know the why, you know, with an urgency to the point going like, I expect it. I'm mad if I don't know the answer. I've got to know the why. And I wonder why we view it as our right to know why. What's our obsession with knowing the why? And I use the word obsession because it does come to the point of obsession where people say, I can't move on in my faith or I can't move on in this relationship until I know the why. That's obsessive. So this has a name. Culturally, this has a name. It's called obsessive rumination. Obsessive rumination. Obsessive rumination is the focus attention on the symptoms of one's distress and on its possible causes and consequences, as opposed to looking at the solutions. See, rumination in its simplest form is to want to ponder, to think about. Uh, rumination would almost be like a cow chewing its cud. You know, if you see a cow that they would, you know, they would bring something that they've eaten out of one of their stomachs back up and rechew it. It's called chewing the cud. And so to ruminate is to bring something back up from the past and rechew on it. And, and sometimes that can be helpful, to be honest, to, 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 to see like, how am I reacting or how do I feel about the situation uh, can be helpful to sometimes problem solve about it. But when it becomes obsessive, when it becomes, when we, when we can't let it go, when we have to reanimate it, when we have to keep replaying the movie in our mind, and we all do this, don't we? Something happens and we replay the movie in our mind. And then every time we replay that movie, it gets a little bit bigger. That situation where that person, you know, bullied you or that person, you know, uh, made fun of you in front of your coworkers or that confrontation situation. I, I see that movie, you know, and every time I replay it in my head, my reaction gets bigger. First, I just walk away. And the next time I replay it, you know, I say something snarky back. And the third time I pull out my, you know, my, my Muay Thai, you know, and I drop kick him in the face and I drop under the ground, you know, and the next time I come back, it's tanks and missiles. And you say like, I'm oh, so over the top. But is it? Don't we all do things? Rumination, obsessive rumination is when we relive something to the point of wanting to know, having to know the why and obsessing over the consequences of it. And it's stressful. Uh, it, it, it magnifies the stress and the importance of the situation in our mind. And it also hones in on people's feelings of helplessness um, that they feel about something that has already happened. There are times when we just want to scream, it isn't fair. And I know some of the things that have, may have happened to you in your life is not fair. And I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that some things have happened to you that were not your fault, that you didn't choose, that wasn't the consequences of your decision making. And for some of you, you may be still stuck in the why. So 
in this series, as we, na- as we take the next few weeks to examine this, we're going to look at how Jesus dealt with this, because this isn't just a modern issue. This, was, this is a humanity issue that um, people are searching for the why. And we're going to examine that. Uh, we're going to look in greater detail about how David dealt with this, because I think that there are principles that we can apply to our life right now today that can help us to respond when life gets turned upside down. And so we're going to be talking more in depth about trust, prayer, and action, and how the three work together. So today, as we look, I I want to wrap up by leaving you a a passage of scripture that I think is important, that puts us in context. Um, Acts chapter 13, verse 36, I'd like to read this to you today. It says this, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. When David had served God's purpose in his own generation. So how do you know when it's done? How do you know when you're done? How do you know when you've accomplished? And I like this, that it's not just put to set time or hours or place, geography, space of existence. This is when David had finished. It's like a season. The season is done when the season is done. We would love it to be full on spring and summer right now, but we still got some colder weather and we're still going through some of those things. The seasons, I mean, winter's done when winter's done. It's not, you know, we can have the exact date saying this is the first day of summer or first day of spring, but the season ends when the season decides it's going to end. And I like in the same context here is that David fell asleep when he had served God's purpose in his own generation. And I want to encourage you, whether you're three years old or whether you're in your 95th birthday, you're not done until you and I have served God's purpose in our generation. We are responsible for our generation. So I want to encourage you and I want to pray with you that in light of what has happened, the good, the bad, the mountaintop, the valleys, that we would serve out God's purpose in our generation, that we would do what he has created you and I to do in our time, what, our allocation of time that he has given to us. Let's just pray right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would serve your purpose in our generation, that our life wouldn't be just to spend on ourself but our life, as you have said, that to find life is to give it away, that as Lord, as we give our life back to you, that we would serve out your generation and your purpose and your destiny in our generation. Father, we thank you for that fullness of purpose. We thank you that you equip us to handle challenging situations when disappointments happen, when, 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 when crisis happens in our life, when, when roadblocks seem to block our way, that Lord, you help us to overcome Father, I thank you that, let, that you'll be with each and every person watching today, Lord. They'll be encouraged by this, that, Lord, you will give them the strength and the wisdom. You give them the necessary steps and direction in the coming weeks and the next season of, of their life, Lord, as they rebuild, Lord, as they bounce back. Father, we thank you that you move us, Lord, and you make us to be overcomers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm.